achieve much if we're not healthy. And I, I see this guy, I've known Ollie for quite a few years now, and I see him running, I see him climbing weights, I see him writing, I see him doing lives. There's nothing this guy doesn't do. <laughs> so he must be super healthy, because otherwise he wouldn't have the energy to do it, right? So enough from me. I'm going to introduce you to Ollie Matthews, who is a health optimization expert. He calls himself a system, but we're going to have a word about that. Okay. <laughs> he was going to talk to you about taking the confusion out of health. So please give Ollie a hand. So guys, first off, thank you all for coming here. As it's bloody freezing out there, so brave in the weather, and as Fabio said, the first month that the price has actually gone up. So I appreciate you guys all coming here. Now, as you can see, we've got the title, How to Take the Confusion Out of Health. In a world where Facebook doesn't let you, because if you try and put an ad on that says health, it throws it straight back at you because it doesn't want the truth spat at you. Now, health is something which has taken, it's, it's changed in my mind over the years from not knowing what health is, thinking I knew what health is, realizing I didn't know what it is, to some sort of balance. And now I think I'm kind of on the right track and still progression, progressing and still learning every single day. It's kind of where we look at social media and we see how we're supposed to be. We see how other people are. We see one side of the story, but we don't see the whole complete spectrum of what is actually going on behind the scenes when people put pictures of amazing food and that they're, they're eating this food every single day of their life. And then they put happy, smiling faces or trout pouts or whatever they put on their selfies nowadays. And it's kind of hard to realize how can we actually be ourselves in this world? And I've been down that road and you'll see this. First off, I'm gonna go through a little bit of my history. So any of you guys, any of you guys here when I talk, uh, spoke 18 months ago, anyone? Apart from Fabia? That's good. <laughs> and, and my mum. My mum's stepped out of my wife. It's good to have your support. And so we're going to go through a little bit of history. The first half is going to go through some diets, some diet protocols. And what I want to pull out of that is that I don't think there's ever one size fits all. Uh, if you'd have asked me five years ago when I was coaching clients, it would have been every single thing that I'd done, my clients would have to do. <clears throat> They'd have to eat chicken and broccoli five times a day because I was competing in bodybuilding shows. And that's not what's going to get healthy, and I'll go through that. We're going to then go through a little bit of MIPS so you can just see that there is some confusion there. And some of the confusion that has actually gone out in the world that people have followed, it isn't necessarily their fault. It isn't your fault if there's been a lesson you've learned, that you've gone down the wrong road for, road for a little while. And then, then we'll have a break, and then we'll go through the big part which is stress. In this world, stress seems to be every single place where we look. And 75% 70, 70 of what I do is not telling people what to eat. It's not telling people how to move and how to train and fit into their schedule. It's simply adding a different perspective on the way we actually manage stress. The first thing we're gonna go into is me. Just, you know, just get my ego out there. I'm Polly, and <laughs> I've been in this industry There we go. I've been in this industry since 2007, I think I first started working in a gym. And uh, that gym was, you could fit it in this room twice. It was <coughs> tiny, it had a swimming pool and then a small gym. But that was me before, well, in fact, I've lost a stone now. I've lost about 14 pounds. And that was me thinking, ah, I'm in all right shape. Then there's me here on a bodybuilding stage in the best physical shape of what it looked like, healthy, where you're in really great shape, you're shredded, you've got veins on top of veins, and there are still people there that absolutely scare you when you go on stage because they just have veins, bulging out of veins on their head. <coughs> Looking a nice natural tan there. <laughs> and this is me in my element. I mean, it wants to come up. I've got to get closer. That's me with my favorite food, nachos and it is something here I want you guys to get across that we can have some sort of balance we have to work on balance but what is actually healthy when it comes to our whole entire life now I've been working with clients from professional athletes to 
general population, entrepreneurs, business guys all around the world. I've had a guy in the Tour de France that I worked with and consulted with a girl in the Olympics for cycling. I've had a guy that won the Ultraman World Championship, the world champion triathlete. Had this guy, Jack Mason, who is a professional MMA fighter. Now, that picture, believe it or not, was five weeks, which is why I'm not a massive fan of body transformation pictures, because that is five weeks preparing for a fight. He came to me, I've had a fight that I want to accept, I've got 92 kilos, I need to be under 77, I think it was 76.9. Five weeks to lose 15 kilos. Thanks Jack, we've done it. He, was, he said it was the best prep he's had, but I'm like, well, how hard did you push in those other preps? And that's where we see these transformation pictures that don't tell the full story, because that looks amazing. To go from this, which is not exactly really out of shape or anything, it's still in decent shape, to go from really shredded. However, uh, then we've got Kerry here as well, who's another professional fighter. <coughs> but then we've got people here that, I think I've got to stand here to actually get the seat for the computer. We've got guys like my dad. And when I was working with these athletes, I have a bit of a backstory. And when I was little, my parents split up and my dad had to move away to provide for his family. And in doing that, he moved first off to Great Yarmouth area, to Caster area. And in doing that, we only saw him weekends, school holidays, not too far to go to Great Yarmouth, to go to Caster. But then we ended up, he got headhunted because he was a caravan salesman, he turned a sales manager, done really well at his job. He got headhunted to then move to a much further away place. Colchester, Wheely Bridge near Clapton, and we, we start only really seeing him in the school holidays because he's providing for his family. He's in this job where he has to hit the targets. He has to make sure he is there every single time for the people on the campsite, for his family, for his friends, for his other half, and he was stressed. Now, as you can see here, this guy isn't exactly overweight, and he likes to laugh. If you saw him on the outside, you would think, yeah, he's a healthy individual. He's not overweight, he's loving life, he's not stressed. He's working a lot. In fact, I remember Christmas of 2000, we were there on the campsite and he was there with, there was a security guard on the camp and we get a knock at the door on Christmas Eve. On Christmas Eve, and it was about nine o'clock, 9.30. So he was still having to do some work on Christmas Eve. And it was stressing us out, or stressing him out. And then he was providing for his family with money. He was sending it over. In fact, <laughs> on the Monday of this week that I'm going to talk about, he sent a message and said, did you get the money? A text message said, did you get the money? Yes. On the Wednesday, he went into hospital with a migraine. And this is the only way you would know he had some problems with his health because the migraines that happened were pretty consistent. In fact, migraines ran in our family for quite a bit. My sisters had them, I used to have them, my uncle had them, and we would get a little bit more stressed to know there's a migraine, which would then add more stress to the fact that we've got it. And on the Saturday, July 28, 2001, my dad passed away, he'd had a stroke, and my family had to make the decision to turn off his life support machine because he was providing for his family. And that stress is something which I didn't get fulfillment in working with athletes. Because if I look at the amount of stress that my dad was under, I look at the amount of stress he was under, and stress stopped him from seeing me and my sister finish school. I was in the last year of high school. Stress stopped him from me passing my driving test, being able to drive down there and take him for a drive, being able to take him for a pint, being able to walk my sister down the aisle. We did have an amazing guy here, Gavin, who's my stepdad, and he walked my sister down the aisle, so I want to thank him as well. But it stopped my dad having to do that. It stopped him being able to be there on my wedding day. It stopped him being able to see his granddaughter, Eden, my niece, being born. And that is something which it really hits me in the heart to know that, yes, I'm working with athletes, but athletes, athletes get you from A to B as fast as possible. Some of those guys in the Tour de France, their testosterone levels go, depending on the test, you see, the testosterone levels go ridiculously low over three weeks. And that's not going to be healthy to mess your hormones up, to stress yourself up that way. And then I started working with guys that were busy, entrepreneurs. In fact, 
it was just over a year ago, I was in Nashville with this guy, an amazing individual called Rick, Rick Barker. And I've never seen anyone as busy as this guy. And he will tell you he's not as busy as a lot of people when we put things into perspective. Most of us aren't busy. Now, Theresa May is quite busy right now, whatever she's doing back there. But in comparison with us, we're not really that busy, even though we may think we are. Now, this guy is the guy that launched that lady's career, Taylor Swift. It was her first manager. When we look in, put in things into perspective, we launched her, helped launch her career, worked for American Idol, worked for a TV show in Canada called uh, The Launch, advised Taylor Swift's manager at the time then, and managed multiple artists. And I'm thinking, hang on, I'm staying in his house. He's got two kids, he's got a wife. This is essentially me helping my dad. This is essentially me, from the heart, realizing that if I can stop even one child having to go through what I went through at 15, then surely it's going to be much better than some sort of plaque or trophy that any sportsman can win. Any sportsman can win, any bodybuilding title I can win, or anything like that. Uh, and then I worked with this guy, Nima, who is a lecturer at Yale, and this guy, Ron. Now that is an amazing transformation, because that is in 14 weeks. I went over there, saw him, we set the plan, I went over there again. They're all remotely, but this guy has a business which brings in seven, eight figures a year, and he's busy, even though he'll, he's so down to earth with it. And working with these guys was so much more fulfillment than simply saying, hey, I worked with a guy in the Tour de France, hey, I worked with a world champion triathlete. So much more fulfillment. And then I decided to put it all into a book for some reason. Uh, some reason as well, I didn't have the confidence to put it out. It was sitting on a hard drive for 18 months. In fact, I sent Flavia the first script that I'd actually written on the, in the book, the first draft of it, and then that was probably two years ago? Yeah. Something like that, a couple of months after we met. <laughs> and then, as you do, when mother-in-law comes around, you decide to <laughs> let her do her thing with your wife, and you edit the book and release it. Uh, as such as well, I've just released female version, the one day body upgrade for females. Now this is not some, uh, some fad to say you can change your body completely in one day. The things that are in this book, there's some of my story, there's things that are from, from the heart, and there's things that I've seen in the industry. And this is about changing your habits one day at a time. You're not going to change your entire life in one day, you're going to change your habits one day at a time. But the cool thing about this book, it went to number one on Amazon in men's health which is confusing for someone that failed English twice in my A-levels and then went to music college because I couldn't write, which that's kind of cool because it was in the US, in Australia. But that actually got me thinking as what is health? We see health all the time on Instagram with hashtag fitspo or hashtag healthy or macros, whatever it is we see. What actually is health? If we look at the definition, health is the state of being free from illness or injury in an individual's physical and mental condition. And again, it got me thinking about how much confusion there is out there. Because how do we actually become healthy? In the book, we've got some chapters on it, but it is a balance of the five M's. There are six up there, I know, but I absolutely hate it when people throw the word macros around because it makes, yeah. Madness, money, movement, macros, mm. marriage, and mindset. In the book, it's just movement. But essentially, it's getting a balance in all of them. When I was on stage, I had an eating disorder. I had movement and macros, all right. My mindset was screwed. I lived at home with my mum and stepdad. I'd done two hours of cardio a day, and yes, people have done it differently. I had no money, and I was mad, but I didn't have any fun in my life. <laughs> and when we look at what these five M's actually stand for, the first one is madness. Madness to me means fun. Not that we're going crazy or anything like that, just having some fun. Letting your hair down and just laughing a little, giggling a little and having some fun. And once we get some fun in our life, we can start to be a bit healthier. And yes, money does help. Money helps. They say it's the root of all evil, but money is gonna help. It's gonna allow us to do some more things. But I have seen people, and this is when I was out over there, over there with Rick. I've seen people that had so much money, but they weren't happy. And then I've seen people earning average wage that are truly happy. 
as we'll see in the second part of this talk. Then we've got movement, macros, which is essentially getting the right movement in. It doesn't have to be exercise, but I thought that image was cool because that's the woman off the front of my book. Uh, it doesn't have to be exercise that we would typically say jumping in the gym, and that's what we're going to get to as well. Then we have marriage. Now, <laughs> I realised that when I was there, half really dating, it was <laughs> drink was in, involved, but it didn't help boost my confidence. I was really overweight, and for the first four or five years, I wouldn't take my t-shirt off when having sex. I was that unconfident with my body. With, it's supposed to be this most intimate moment. It's supposed to be two people loving each other and so on and be such a personal moment I wouldn't take my t-shirt off. In fact, it was around that first picture where I would first take my t-shirt off when having sex. And that made me realise that I need to do something about this. It wasn't going to the end of the drive and getting out of breath and needing my inhaler because of how bad my asthma was. It was the fact it was the fact that taking my t-shirt off when having sex was just a no-go. I had no confidence in that. In fact, a lot of the times as well, I wouldn't look in the mirror with my t-shirt off because of what I saw staring back at me. And that was my why as to why I want to do things. And I put a podcast out every week with, we've got Rachel who's uh, Roger's assistant. <coughs> Where is Roger? He's not ill again. No, he's taxi service on the Thursday. Ah, okay. Night. Doing the important duties. He'll see it anyway. I put a, a podcast out with my friend, chiropractor, Roger Wood, and we were talking about goals a couple of weeks ago. And when it comes to goals, if I'd have looked at that goal was just losing weight, that goal wouldn't have been fulfilling. That goal wouldn't have been why I wanted to do something because people say a goal is to lose weight, a goal is to put on weight, put on muscle. But no one wants to lose weight. Nobody wants to lose weight when they say they want to lose weight. There's an underlying reason as to why they want to lose weight. Whether that's to build your confidence up, whether that's to do a presentation and not be completely bloated and round your face, whether that's just to be able to have more energy for your family, be more present, have more sex because your libido is higher. Libido, not libido. Uh, because your libido is higher. Laura was thinking about that and then was about to pick it out. Oh, you said libido, not libido. Because your libido is higher. And once you find out that why, and I say to clients, is why do you want this result? Why? 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 I'm going to actually go through five whys as to why they want it. Dive deeper and deeper in. And yes, I've had people cry because they've really hit an emotional part of where they want to go. And that is when we know we've actually hit the right why. And once people do that, right up on the fridge or wherever it is in a private place where you want to have it, people know they're doing it for the right reasons. So when it comes to why you do things, just ask yourself a little bit more. Why am I doing this? Why am I doing that? And we have to make sure that certain things are taken into account when it comes to your plans, essentially. <coughs> what is actually going to work for you? And this is where a lot of people go and they see it work for someone else. It would have been what I would have done with a client years ago, just saying, this is working for me, it's going to work for you. Or... This will work for them, it's going to work for you. You need to do this training, you need to do that training. But what is going to work for you? It needs to be able to fit your schedule. Don't set yourself up to do five sessions a week if you can only make two. <coughs> I would rather someone start on the minimum, the bare minimum of what they can do and build up. It's what we call success stackers. Once we get successful, we can build on that success. If you start off with five and you only get three, you're going to be annoyed because you failed essentially on that first week and then your goal starts slipping away. What is gonna fit your relationships? And this comes down to it as well, is that if I was thinking about doing another bodybuilding show and it's no way gonna happen in my near future because I love nachos too much, but I would have to have a discussion with my wife and say that these 12, 16, 20 weeks, whatever it is, are gonna be a little bit stricter than normal or discussing your goals of what is not just gonna work for you. If you've got a family, how are you going to have family time there as well as going to the gym and sorting your food out? Because it's boring taking chicken and broccoli to the cinema on a first date because I've done it. Luckily, it wasn't with Laura, even though she says she's done it now. I've done it before, but didn't have a second date because I'm now married with Laura. <laughs> then in
it needs to fit your preferences. There are so many ways you can work out. There are so many different food types, so many different foods, different methods of dieting. That if you start something and you don't like it, don't bloody do it. It's as simple as that. If you don't like doing heavy squats, don't do heavy squats. However, just realize that some of the things that might be in your goals, if you want to become Eddie Hall and be world's strongest man, you're probably going to have to do some heavy, heavy squats. <laughs> That's a mix. It's probably going to have to do some heavy squats. And also your health history. Yes, we do want to improve health. Yes, I'm a massive believer that any cell in the human body can be regenerated. But we have to take into account your history, not start you in the deep end if you can't even tread water in the shallow end. We have to make sure we build up from there. And also moderation. Moderation is going to be so key because if we go all out from 100% of this to 100% of that, we're setting ourselves up for failure again. And that's where we come to picking the right diet. Picking the right diet. I'm only going to go through four here. And I've tried three out of the four. Odd days of the fourth one. You'll be able to guess which one it is once I've actually gone through. But the first one is the ketogenic diet. Now, there are some benefits of all of these diets. The first one with ketogenic dieting is that you're going to have quick weight loss. But that is weight. It's not necessarily fat loss. Because in your body, we have sugar stores, glycogen stores. It goes into our muscles. It gives us energy. It helps fuel the brain. But when we have glycogen going into our muscles, every one gram of carbohydrates, glycogen that goes into the muscles, takes in three to four grams of water. Now, we go ketogenic. We take carbohydrates out, essentially. It's low protein or moderate protein, high fat, very low carbs. And we take that water out at the same time as taking those carbohydrates out. And what happens? We see people drop 10, 15 pounds in a week. Amazing. Next week they drop two and wonder what have they done wrong. What has happened? All that water has been drawn out. All that water has been drawn out by taking those carbohydrates out. We're then kind of stuck as to where do we go next. And then it's the true loss that comes from being in a caloric deficit. Is there going to be a time when a ketogenic diet is great? Yeah. If you're really overweight, got a lot to lose, it could be good to kickstart you. We'll get down to the negatives in a minute. It can help lower blood pressure. It can help suppress your appetite. Because protein, fats, they're very satiating. And it can help regulate your hormones. However, it is very unsustainable for the general population. People like yourselves, people like me. Because when you actually go out to eat, especially in Norwich, it's better in America, it's okay in London, there's actually ketogenic restaurants now, it's getting better, just like gluten-free was really hard to actually go out and have gluten-free diet before. <clears throat> but there are some restaurants which cater for it. However, if you want to go out and have a social life, then it's very unsustainable for the general population. If you are very on top of things and you know exactly what is going on and you're being really anal about your diet, then yeah, you could be able to do it. Some people will do it. It can or it does require an adaptation period where your body will essentially go over to start burning fats. There is a debate on whether your body will burn it more effectively. This is talking about general population rather than endurance athletes, because as soon as we get over a certain heart rate percentage, or percentage of our maximum heart rate, it's harder to burn fat as fuel. So you get very irregular. And to be fair, most of the population thinks that going to the toilet once every two, three days is quite normal. It's not. So once every day, twice every day, is much more normal. It can cause high cholesterol. And don't go on a first date when you're in a ketogenic state unless they're uh, ketogenic as well, because it, your breath smells a little bit. Can I, can I ask, Ollie, what is a ketogenic diet? I've heard of it, I have no idea. It's basically where you take the carbohydrates away and your body has to switch its fuel source from glycogen to fats, which is ketones. Yeah. Essentially, they're in your bloodstream, and it has to build them up in order to actually function. Now, what it does in the long term, it then converts those ketones into a usable energy form, which is glycogen anyway. Oh, okay. In the long term. So you take all the carbs out. Yeah, but then it ends up converting them into carbs for energy, but in a different form with less the health factors like that. Uh, and it takes a, a while to actually do that. Now, in that two weeks, if it's two weeks, you might be longer, it might be shorter. You're going to be very low on energy, you're going to be dehydrated, very irritable, and it's not the nicest person to be around when you do that. Oh, we're on this side now. 
And this one is the vegan diet. And with this diet, again, you can get quick weight loss, usually because you take out the meat, you put in vegetables and it's higher fiber, rather than having the meat in there, you end up having lower calories. Again, you pull some of the water out because you end up having more fibrous carbs rather than the starchy carbs without even realizing a lot of the time. Environmentally, it's technically sustainable, unless you are that little field mouse that's in the field, in its nest, trying to provide for its kids, and that massive field over there, full of lettuces and full of loads of spinach and things like that, the combine harvesters come along, the mouse has come along to get that food, it's had its head chopped off. It's not very sustainable when those little mouse are actually dying in their nest. It's just not cool. I don't think there's any study to prove that one. You get high antioxidant levels, which is great because it helps fight free radicals, it helps boost your immune system and so on. Now, there are negatives with this. That most of the time, unless you are really on top of what foods you're having, you need to get some good vitamin, vitamin, D, uh, D, vitamin B12 in there and other supplements as well. It's not very satiating. Now, when I was over in San Diego with the guy one that I showed at the start, we went to a vegan restaurant. I didn't know it was a vegan restaurant, and neither did he, until we got there with our mates, and like, great. I had three burgers, just the patties, no buns. I was stuffed, because it was like black bean burgers. I was stuffed for about 20 minutes, and then I was starving again, and we had to go to Chipotle and get another meal. Now, on top of that, we both stunk out the hotel room that night, because it was quite hard to digest that protein, the amount that we had. And, uh, You'll probably find when you get the legumes, when you get loads of beans and things like that, that it's harder to digest that protein. Therefore, you might end up having to take more digestive supplements and so on. Now, the next one is going to be, I should have put it that side because there's a massive burger behind there, intermittent <laughs> fasting. And now, this is essentially which you'll eat in a certain window. It's becoming more and more popular. I'm not talking about fasting for days on end and so on. I'm just talking about intermittent fasting. You have a window of eating. Usually, you do something like... Uh, 16 hours of fasting, 8 hours of eating. Or some people do 20 hours of fasting, 4 hours of eating. Now, it's good because if you're sleeping for 8, 9 hours, you fast them when you sleep. You stop eating a couple of hours before bed, you're not hungry, you start eating 2, 3 hours after you wake up, which essentially is just skipping breakfast that way. Now, intermittent fasting does have good benefits for gut health. There are studies that show that our bacteria, those little people, I was going to say men there, but those little things that are in there, I didn't want to be sexist at all. Good bacteria help get regenerated when have an intermittent fasting diet. When there's periods of no food in there, all the food is digesting through the digestive tract. It allows you to have bigger meals. Great. But that can also be a drawback as well, because if you can't digest the food and you have a massive meal, you've got a lot to digest at once. However, if you're busy in the morning and you go through lunch and you go up to uh, the evening you want to eat at a restaurant because you've got a big schedule, then great. You can eat out, you can have chips, you can have a burger. It's still essentially going to be a calorie deficit, which is going to be the big thing here. It can help promote fat loss. There was a study that showed, and if anyone wants to know these studies as well, just drop me a message afterwards on Facebook and I can find them as well uh, in my files. Um, I should have actually posted them down the bottom, but it can help promote fat loss. There was a study that actually showed that the same population now, I don't know who funded the study, so I'm going to put that in there, um, but I don't think it was for supplements. One population had a certain amount of calories, the other population had the same calories. One spread their food out throughout the day, one just had an intermittent fasting window, window of eight hours. Now, the one that spread their food out throughout the day did lose weight. The one that intermittent fasted lost more fat. They lost weight, pretty similar, but lost more fat when they'd done the actual tests, which is interesting to see, and it can aid brain function, which a lot of people do seem to promote as a benefit, especially in the worlds which I've run in with being an entrepreneur mastermind and things like that. However, a lot of those guys are also using different nootropics and other stimulants in order to help them with their brain function and productivity, which can be another benefit as well if that's what, what you like doing. The negatives is that if you are highly active, if you're an athlete and you go and train in the morning, you do two, three hours of brick sessions if you're a triathlete, then you don't eat until later on. You could have some sort of hormonal imbalance, not just one session or two sessions, but doing it quite a long time over time. And again, if you are in an eating window and it stops at eight o'clock, 
but someone's booked a meal for nine o'clock, then it could have a social impact. The last one is the macros and counting calories. There are benefits. You get a very high flexibility of foods. Now, macro counting is something which you will go on an app, something like MyFitnessPal or Mike's Macros, and it's become a massive popularity today because people see a calorie is just a calorie, which essentially for weight loss it is, but we need to take stress and the amount of stress that has in your food as well. Uh, it has a high flexibility of foods. You log it in, you can have what you want. You have a certain calorie deficit, and it's a great place to start before we go into the food quality, getting your nutrient bases covered. And it can suit a lot of lifestyles, especially if you're busy, a lot of traveling, if you're going to airports, if you're going to service stations, all these things actually get benefit from being able to count your calories. My fitness pal, you just bleep your barcode and it finds it. Some people haven't put them in right, which is annoying because you end up thinking, oh, I've had no carbs, but all you've had is rice cakes during the day or something. Like, something's not right here. It's great for social people and easy to manage around travel. Now, the bad things are that if there's a history of eating disorders that you hadn't got sorted out by myself, then you can have trigger foods. Mine used to be peanut butter, which is so nice. <laughs> a spoon, a big tub. And it used to be that you just couldn't stop. So you started getting it in there and you couldn't just stop at one teaspoon, you end up having ice cream scoops. <laughs> serving <laughs> spoons. <laughs> Those were the days. And you can overeat very easily. And also, potentially, a lower nutrient content because you've just counted calories. <coughs> and they'll count macros as well, the amount of proteins, fats, and carbohydrates, but when we look at the micronutrients, how many vitamins and minerals are in there, we need to cover a certain baseline on there. And then Sorry. it brings me to this one, which I saw on Instagram a couple of weeks ago. We're going to call it Thinning World for <laughs> advertising by copyright. Can I stop you for a minute, Ollie? <laughs> Trigger foods. Yep. Now, somebody mentioned this the other day. Was it you, Serena? Certain foods, if you eat them, you crave them. You crave more straight away. Is it that it's a, if you've got an intolerance to certain foods. Yeah, and also if you've got if low you, nutrients and if as well. You, yeah, but if um, you've got an intolerance to certain foods and you eat that food, there's something to do with the antibodies in the body that will actually make you crave and want to eat more of that same food, like wheat, for example. Yeah, and a lot of that is to do with the inflammation that it causes. Yeah, exactly. And again, it's just to say with gluten and things like that, gluten is not bad unless you've got an intolerance to it. And... In America, that's the only study I could find when I was doing gluten before in, in my masters, is that there is about 70-75% of Americans have a sensitivity, not intolerance, but sensitivity to gluten. The actual amount of people that are actually gluten intolerant or celiac is very low. Now, you can come back from being celiac. And when I go into the stress side of things, I'll talk about the story behind it, but I was celiac, and then we managed over three years to fix the gut health. and really improve the health and diagnose that no longer celiac, which we'll get into in the actual stress side of things. And um, a lot of the times with that, when people have low serotonin and things, they can crave chocolate uh, because it helps boost their serotonin production. And it, it's, there's so much into the chemistry of it. I'm a geek and I love going into it. Um, but yeah, you can crave a lot more foods. And if you've got an emotional attachment to it as well, where I used to eat a lot of crisps, a lot of crisps purely because of the fact that when I was around my nans, when my dad was alive, and he would come home on a Friday or Saturday night when we did go there by my nans, we ended up, match of the day would come on, my nan would get the massive bag of Walker's crisps at like half 10 at night, and me and my dad would eat a six pack all together. We didn't get a six pack, we'd eat a six pack. And uh, he would end up getting the plain ones, I would have the salt and vinegar and cheese and onion, so I would have four, he'd have two, which is obviously where that started. But, uh, it turned out in my early 20s, before I went on this weight loss journey, is that I started eating a lot more crisps. So I would get the big bag because it was comforting. It would remind me of being there with my dad on a Saturday night eating these crisps. And a lot of times with that, you can your trigger foods will have some emotional attachment with it. And we can dive into that. The person amazing on this subject as well, of actually helping treat is that lady at the back, Flavia, who's going into hypnotherapy and can really help look at these triggers and 
should help you a lot with things like fear of flying and some uh, eating issues as well. Now, back to our regular schedule program, spinning well. <laughs> we have chicken sausages, <coughs> half a sin. Steak is apparently sin free. Chicken fry, bonus to skin this, sin free. Fried eggs, sin free. Fries, as long as they're cooked in active fry, sin free. Fried onion pepper, sin free. You, you can see where I'm going with this. Now, people get results on programs like this. Just like the WW1, they changed their name because they want to take weight out of it, and now they won't tell you what the W actually stands for. Uh, they've got a very low success rate, but when 100,000 or a million people are doing it, a success rate, which essentially is getting lower than a 25 BMI, is actually gonna be quite a high numerical value. That BMI is 25, if you stay under it for five or six years, you're classed as a success. That's not taking into account the people that were 26 BMI and go down one BMI and go under. It's those people that are 35, 45 and so on that are gonna have the issues there. And also, it's not taking into account people that had severe disease, chronic disease, life-changing disease, and things like cancer, heart attacks and things like that. It's not taking into account, they use them in their statistics, which, if you took them out, it was a 2% success rate. But anyway, with this, sin free. Now, I don't believe that people that are doing this program are gonna be eating that five times a day. But if they did, with all these calories in, serving two, it works out at around, I'm gonna say 1,000 calories because I may have miscounted. Looking at these, looking at the rough amounts, is about 1,400, well, let's say 1,000 calories. Now, there was around five to sin, 15 sins per day, depending on the program you're on, your activity levels and so on, which would mean that if a woman gets around 1,500, a man gets around 2,000 calories, based on doing no activity at all, and what the recommended guidelines, not where your hormonal status is or anything like that, you'll be overeating three times the amount you need by having a one sin meal like that. Which is why it is not, it's not the people that are doing it who are the ones that go, oh, they're doing this program, they're doing that program. It's the system that is failing the people and the awareness there. Because people are trying. People are trying. It's not their fault that a mother like yogurt used to be sin free and now it's one sin or whatever it is, even though it has exactly the same amount of calories in. I overheard someone at the gym that I go to and she said, oh, I put on a pound this week. And it was the same week that she'd actually started counting mother like yogurts or something. She used to have like six or seven yogurts. Now let's say there were 100 calories each. That's six, 700 calories. With a meal being four or 500 calories for a big meal, that's a full meal extra you could have rather than those mother-like yogurts. Now, that's just some, getting some awareness in there. And here's the thing, is that when we go to start our diet, when we go to start our nutrition plan or anything like that, we treat it like buying a lottery ticket. And with that, it's essentially, when you get a lottery ticket, you scribble your numbers, or you used to scribble your numbers down, I don't know what my numbers are now, they're just in an app. But I remember when you used to get some sort of ticket like that, you'd scribble it down, they'd put it through the machine, and you'd be thinking, oh, I've got to buy this, I've got to buy this. <laughs> get this house, and get that yacht, pay off my mum's mortgage, and buy a car, and all this stuff. And then you'd go out of the shop and completely forget about it. We don't go in, we think we're going to start it, but we don't believe we're going to actually win. We don't believe we're going to get that million pounds or two million pounds, whatever it is. We don't believe we're going to finish this diet, this nutrition plan. And we're talking about sustainability here over the long term, which is one reason, I don't know why I keep saying diet, I don't like the word, we'll keep it in for now. And once we start actually believing, once we have some self-belief over our diet working, over our plans working, once we believe in ourselves, we will start to see more and more results. Now there are myths, and unicorns being one of them, but these myths are gonna be Essentially things like carbohydrates are gonna make you fat. That's a lot of nachos. <laughs> it's so annoying that that restaurant isn't there anymore in Roxham. But <laughs> carbohydrates don't make you fat. Eating too many calories makes you fat. Some people don't eat carbohydrates for so long and they see their weight and they say carbohydrates make them bloated. No, because they've just put carbohydrates back in their diet. What's happened? Water's come back in. They may have more energy. They may feel better, they're more focused and they feel amazing but they put on weight. Carbohydrates don't make you fat. Now, you don't need to go on a detox. You don't need to blend all this stuff up. It can help, but first off, before we go into all this, 
let's just stop eating so much crap. Uh, literally, our body will detox itself if we let it. Unless you've got some problems with your vital organs, your body will detox itself over time. Now, it regenerates your skin and your hair every 35 or so days, roughly. Um, so, why can't we let it do the same with food? Why do we have to keep giving it a detox tea, a slim tea, and then run to the toilet and realize there's no toilet paper there or something? <laughs> it's just, why do we do it? It doesn't make sense. The body is designed to detox itself naturally. We could help it with some lemon water, some lime water. It has a thing in it called d limonene which helps the detoxification process. It helps it but it is essentially gonna do it over time if we stop eating so much rubbish. Then also, after 6 p.m., you gain weight, which is confusion, confusing when you go into different time zones and the body is completely confused as to when it's 6 p.m. Should I just put on weight? Should I not put on weight? <laughs> Calories are gonna mean you put on weight. Remember, we're basing this more on weight than just fat loss or anything like that. Calories are gonna make you put on weight. There is a study and a very good book with uh, Dr. Rangan Chatterjee is uh, The Stress Solution, which I absolutely love. And he's talking about with eating before bed. If you stop eating two, three hours before bed, then there are studies that show your digestive health is better. Your sleep is better, which means your stress levels help to get lowered, which means you have a better chance of your body letting go of fat and actually losing it, rather than being in this really high stress state. The next one that goes on is that no pain, no gain. Now. I used to be really into this beast mode and stuff like that. There is a time and a place, but for the average population, we don't need to train as hard to the point that we're gonna just not be able to walk or sit down on the toilet for four or five days. <laughs> if it makes you not wanna go to the gym the next day, maybe you push a little hard. I used to be that trainer that was there and pushing people in squats and think, yes, this is amazing. They can't walk down the stairs. And then wonder why my clients didn't come back. Now, we have to be wanting to do the exercise. If you are doing a bodybuilding show, then great going to push a little bit hard. If you're doing a powerlifting show, if you've got an event or something like that, or like Jack with his uh, mixed martial arts, he's going to have to push harder during that time for a certain time period. If you really want to get those results, but we're talking about general population here. And also, weigh yourself daily. That's one way, unless you're going to take an average of this. If you're like I used to be, you get the scales out, right in the middle, and first off you say, I love, how's it going? I feel amazing today. Great. I'm going to have such a great day. Scales there, right in front of you. Take everything off. Huh? Not gonna do it here. Then you get on the scales. Shit, I've got on a pound. And then it's just ruined your whole entire day. And then with that, it's just weight. It's a number that is pulling you down to gravity. It's a relationship between you and gravity. Also, alcohol makes you fat. Be old Kermit. Alcohol doesn't make you fat you out, it can lower your sleep quality, which can uh, attribute to high fat levels and inflammation and so on, and drunk calories. When I was in music college, UK Pizza knew I ordered before we actually answered, and that's when I realized I had a problem. <laughs> <laughs> so cheesy chips, chili burger, great. Who did not get the takeaway? But that's when you know that those drunk calories that you're not going to remember, your actual willpower will lower a little bit with alcohol. And awareness is key in that matter. So we know that awareness is key. Now, with that, we go to our office, people have put nuts or Maltesers or Smarties or whatever it is in the office. I haven't been in an office for so long with that. When I was there working in Aviva, I had mini eggs and so on, and you eat them without even realizing. Just like when you go in the cinema, no food is there to actually be conscious about eating. You pick up the, <coughs> and you pick up the bite size. We know what we're doing, when we're picking up that donut and we're aware of it, tracking it, you need to be aware of it even more. As soon as you're aware of it, as soon as you add something into the mix as to why we want to track it, then we're gonna actually get some better results. This one is probably, I hate wine. Can't stand the taste of it. We were at an event the other week and we had to toast and it was, in fact, at our wedding when we done it with Prosecco, I had to spit it back in the glass. Oh. It's horrible. <laughs> but a lot of people like wine. And this is another thing we spoke about on the podcast. And Wine, people say having a glass every night is going to help de-stress me. Some people say it's good for health. Now, binge drinking is a lot more common than we think. Because people have the, the glass every night. People then end up that they're going out on a Friday night having two or three glasses. Before they know it, they've finished the bottle. Then 
then come Saturday or Sunday, they'll have a couple of uh, flasks with lunch and then a couple of finish the bottles there and then had six, seven bottles a week to themselves without even realizing, without having that awareness. That is essentially going to be binge drinking. Would you actually put seven bottles and drink them all at once? No. And every now and then, great, awareness, moderation, key. And this is the last one, is that we have this voice in our head. Our voice in our head, which I'm going to call it the inner venom. I love that film. Love superhero films, funnily enough. And this voice, it was walking past something and it says, eat me. No. What? I want food. And we need to be able to control that. Well, if Tom Hardy says that, how do you expect us to have any self-awareness? Well, Tom Hardy doesn't. This, this thing here, Venom says it. But this is where we have to listen to that voice in our heads and actually realise, is it something we really want? And if you want it, cool. If you're intolerant to gluten and you want a bit of cake that has gluten in, be prepared. You might feel rubbish for the next two, three days. If you're really that sensitive to it, you'll know you don't want to, you don't want to feel that bad. And that's where self-respect <clears throat> and awareness is going to come into the place. Now, have a break in a second, but in summary, we need to find out why. Find why we're doing things. We need to find which food is going to work for you, what method of nutrition, and that goes the same with training as well, find out what exercise is going to work. We need to have fun. Have fun. If, if you don't like, I was doing a podcast in... Uh, a guy's, he's a guy of the program Hunters. He's doing a podcast in his living room and he's, I want to lose some weight. I'm growing past 50. And he's like, well, don't just go to the gym and see what the trainer wants you to do. If you don't like going to the gym, don't go to the gym. Have fun. If you like walking in nature, go and have fun. If you like catching fugitives like he do, maybe doesn't do it from a proper Norfolk app like he do. <laughs> maybe don't do it from the office and actually go out on the road. Now, also, awareness is going to get you far. And accountability is going to be the big thing that is going to allow you to get success. That isn't necessarily hiring a coach. That could be putting a picture up on the wall and say, look, share that on Facebook if I don't change in that time. Or you do a reverse bet with someone for a charity that you don't like or a, a cause you don't like. And you put £100 there and say, if I don't do the results, they get that money. And these things are going to be powerful. Now, that's what we've got for the nutrition side. The stress side is going to be much better. And... That is coming.